to our next presenter. This is Dr. Christoph Karmonik. Uh, he received his PhD in natural science in Germany and he's currently the scientific director of Translational Imaging Center at Houston Methodist Academic Institute. He's also the director of Magnetic Resonance Imaging Care. He will be presenting the topic, Music is Medicine. Thank you so much for having me. Great pleasure. Um, and I would like to advance to the next slide on my presentation here. Oh, there we go. Never mind. There we have it. All right. Yes, thank you. So. Um, this is a study I, I, we, did, we did together with the Center for Performing Arts Medicine and the motivation here was to see how to translate uh, 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 collaborative potential of arts and medicine uh, to, the health, uh, to the healthcare environment in Houston Methodist. And here on this di diagram, very nicely displayed, are the different uh, parts of, of, of uh, you know, uh, tasks and ideas that, uh, co that CPAM is combining. And there's basic and translational research, and it should also then, uh, with arts integration, community partnerships, and also then go into holistic care and clinical arts therapy. Um, next slide here. I would like to talk a little bit more about the particular study that we performed. And it was really motivated by a first study done in, in, in Helsinki. Um, that was actually in 2008 when we started with that. And um, uh, the idea here was really to see is music helpful in recovery from stroke. Uh, uh, this um, study as it was done had three groups. There was uh, a group that had uh, listening, listened to music, uh, a group that listened to audiobooks, and, and then controls which had neither. And um, I will show some results in, in a moment there. But uh, actually, just recently, or, you know, so one point in 2014 that, that followed up, uh, also looking at structural changes. And even most recently, the publication has appeared by that group, which actually shows uh, uh, further evidence uh, you know, to, to music being, being helpful or being, being uh, uh, beneficial for stroke recovery. Um, now, the study at the time in 2008, what, what was done in Helsinki was not imaging. It was related at neuropsychological testing. And um, you see here the different uh, uh, parts that were tested, verbal memory, language, uh, visual spatial cognition, short-term short working memory. And, and if you look at, at all these different plots here, and uh, the stars indicate statistically significant significance, um, that, that happens in some of them. But what we see in all of them, the dotted line is actually the music group and, and, and all of those, the music subjects, uh, the subjects listen to music, they actually did better. Okay? So this is, this is very encouraging, of course, and then we all know music is beneficial. We like to listen to music, music does as well, right? But what does it actually do in the brain, right? Is there a way to actually see, look, so to speak, into the brain, right, while, while we're listening to music? And of course, there is functional MRI. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with it, what it actually does, it measures the change of, of oxygenated blood flow to brain regions, so local changes of oxygen uh, 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 delivery while performing a certain task. Um, of course, it's been done in the MRI scanner, and this is lying down, uh, listening. Uh, so, so for listening to music, it's actually relatively easy, right? You have headphones uh, that block out most of the noise of the scanner, and then you actually have subjects listening to music. And so we did a first uh, preliminary study, and what you see here, um, the idea really evolved around familiar and non-familiar music. So basically familiar music that also has the components of, of something that, that you like, that you, that you used to, so, so self-selected in the sense that you have a pleasant memory to. And then non-familiar, really, really more like here, we, we talk about Bach, which is classical music. And we were very curious, so how does the brain react to that? And uh, if you look at this particular slides here, which shows the brain in three different orientations, color overlaid is the activation that we see with different music genres. Um, orange is, uh, uh, is the self-selected familiar part, and then blue is, is the non-familiar part. And for those of you familiar with the brain, you see the primary auditory cortex sliding up or more involved uh, when you listen to the self-selected music, as is the brainstem, as is the limbic system, and as is the anterior cingulate cortex. And uh, 
little bit complementary to that, what you actually see is that the non-familiar music uh, is in a parietal lobe attention, right? So, so if you look at that picture here, you know, it looks like you know if you have both, right? If you have the, the non-familiar and the familiar music, you really see see activation all over in the brain, right? So we know the brain is very complex, and and music is a very complex stimulus, and so the activation should you know reflect that, and that's actually true, right? It's a very complex activation pattern there, and again having the non-familiar and familiar music seems to really, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, train, the, you know, uh, uh, get, the, get the brain really going, so to speak. <laughs> um, so we took this one step further after we were encouraged by this particular, by this, by this pr preliminary findings. And so we had subjects, and these, these were uh, uh, 12 subjects, uh, listening to a variety of music clips. So there, is, uh, there was Bach that we had before, there's a self-selected music. Um, and, then, and then we have um, Bach visual that was actually uh, the same Bach uh, invention number one, uh, um, played with the score sheet with the cursor going through to keep the intention of the subject going. Gagaku is actually uh, a Japanese opera, an excerpt from a Japanese opera, which is unfamiliar to, to Westerners. Right? And, and, and most of our subjects, all of them were actually grown up here in the, in, in the Western world. Um, then, then we had click with is the Sousa language of the African aborigines. It's like a mixture between language and, and music. Charlie Chaplin um, giving an emotional speech of a great dictator. And, 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 and last there, uh, Walter Cronkite uh, reading news. And Walter Cronkite, I believe, was, was, was very good actually in not putting emotions in speech. So we have emotional speech, non-emotional speech, speech. We have so, sort of like a transition between music and, 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 and language. And then we have uh, music, and that goes from unfamiliar to familiar, all right? And what you see in this particular slide is, is uh, the brain from the top, so the ears should be left and right, and uh, each of those little plots is, is one subject, and you see certain patterns, and the color corresponds to the brain activation from the volt effect. And the first thing you see, right, for all these, 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 these 12 subjects, for a particular music clip, or, or, or then what we actually see is the similarity of the pattern. So, so we can really see the functional connectivity, which is, is a measure of or an indication of, really changes, so the brain rearranges uh, uh, areas that participate in decoding the, the music or you know, uh, listening to the music, attentively listening to the music, depending on the music, and kind of music. And I, I think this is, this is really very exciting and very, very, very helpful, I believe, if you then want to go forward and saying, well, what we really want to do is uh, actually use this for therapy. So in other words, we play different music genres to subjects. And in that respect, we hope to change the functional connectivity in the brain. So really, you know, maybe stress the brain, right, or really challenge the brain. Um, and in that way, really aid recovery or, or keep, keep the brain at least engaged. Okay. Um, so we actually started a tra clinical trial, stroke recovery and music and no music, so two groups, one listening to music, one listening to auditory books. And here this was after 45 days, uh, um, seven subjects only, uh, just, just showing us as an interim result. Uh, on the left we have language, on the right we have music. And what you see, first of all, two different connectivity patterns. That's number one. And number two, you also see language is more, the language pattern that has increased in red here is really more on the left in the language subjects, which, you know, language is on the left, so this makes all sense. And maybe in this plot, what you cannot really see so much on the music side is that all over the brain, there are pockets where actually connectivity increased in the limbic system. Again, this is the brain here shown from the top a little bit, so you don't really see inside of it. Um, but here now, this is uh, you know the last year's result, end of last year's results. Every single subject, nine subjects, and in red is increase of connectivity. And if you look, uh, you know, the, the, all the ones that, that listen to music of the music group there, uh, you can really see they're all red, right? It's all an increase. Whereas on on, on the, the group for, for the words, right, you you actually see a little bit of blue. So so actually, you know, connectivity stayed the same or maybe decreased to some extent. All right. So this, this again, is, is very, very encouraging. And then you, you take this one step further, of course, right? You can really quantify then put numbers to that. And overall, in the music group, actually, connectivity overall increased. And, and the number is a little bit an arbitrary number here, 25. But then, then you look at, 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 at the auditory books, and actually, it's negative, right? So, so connectivity actually decreased. 
So, so this, is, this is really very encouraging to see the power of music here. Um, along with that, we, sit, we did some neuropsychological testing. This is something we still will analyze, of course. Uh, but looking at the imaging results here, it really appears music has a beneficial effect in increasing functional connectivity in this, in this group, in this population over time. So, uh, mm, you know, um, that is uh, something what we would like to continue now. We would like to finish our enrollment, uh, uh, have five in the music, five subjects in the music group, five in the auditory books, and five uh, in, in control. Um, and, and we will, of course, add our uh, motor uh, psychological testing results at these different time points that you've seen here at, at 0, 45, and 90 days. So the entire listening period was 90 days, and we have interim results for 45 days. And then we have idea maybe to expand the study, and uh, we will just see how that goes, right? I and mean, we really hope that COVID will let us. <laughs> this is something challenging, and um, um, nevertheless, I mean, we're all optimistic here, and, and we are really, you know, very, very, very excited that, that music can, can have the effect it does here. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carmoni. That was a really beautiful presentation. The one question I had was, when we talk about music, you know, in terms of like sound versus sound with words, and yep. then sound with words and video, yep. would that make a difference in terms of recovery and prognosis? Well, this is a very, very interesting question, and this is something we could certainly test, right? Uh, um, and I would, I would be tempted to say yes, because it, seem, it appears to more attention, right, or, or increasing the attention in the brain, right, that would certainly p keep the brain more and more engaged. So if you have visual stimulus in, in addition to auditory, so sounds, right, then, then actually a song, right, which will, you know, memory, language processing, and then visual, right, you will get more comprehensive activation. So the answer is probably yes, but you'll have to look into this, of course, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Can I ask one? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to say, that's interesting because one of the things we struggle with on the, the rehab side is getting in to see folks we all think earlier is better, mm -hmm. okay? But in the ICU, for instance, sometimes blood pressure is a problem. Yeah. So music, I mean, it, we could do that. And I hadn't, you know, I guess the question is how early? So uh, that would be really interesting to know because our ICU patients, right? We could play. They hear all kinds of sounds, yeah. but um, intimidating at the time, right? And yeah. So but you could start early before they yeah. could yeah. sit edge of bed before they could walk. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is a wonderful environment here, you know, Methodist uh, to do these things, right? Very, very progressive, very open to improving patient care. And so, I mean, we should talk more and see, you know, with CPEM together, Sounds right? Good. How we can to implement yeah. that? Yeah. Thank you so much.